my name's Winston Ellis, and you'll see me in Pirates of the Caribbean, Batman and Night Dark Knight Rises, Fast and the Furious, and also No Time to Die. Please join me and my really good friend Ben on the lost world of movie props. We're going to be talking about all kinds of crazy stuff. So tune in. Hello, everybody. My name's Ben Robbins. I'm the host of the Lost World of Movie Props, and today I'm here with Winston Ellis. How are you doing, sir? Oh, I'm good, thank you, Ben. It's good to catch up with you finally. <laughs> yeah, it's nice to see you, man. It's nice to talk to you in person. <laughs> <laughs> and how have you been keeping? You had a busy week? It's been crazy. Do you know what I mean? The beginning of this uh, year has been quite quiet, and then all of a sudden, over the last couple of weeks, I've just signed on to do two TV series, two films, and it's just been mad. So I started filming last week, and I'm filming right away through now to the end of September. So... It's going to be crazy. It's going to be a crazy time, but good. That's wonderful. I was glad that you've got so much work on and it's all coming your way. <laughs> Finally, I'd say, because yeah, after COVID, you know what I mean? Everything sort of died down after COVID. So it's kind of good to be getting back into the swing of things again. Yeah, you know? awesome. So thank you so much for being on today. So I've got some, some questions I want to talk to you about your career and go through a little bit. Are you happy to do that? Let's make it happen, man. Let's do it. Cool. So when I was researching you and looking you up, I noticed that your background, you've got a real martial arts background. You started off in like martial arts films. So did the martial arts come first or did you want to be in films first? How did that intertwine? I never wanted to be in films. Right. <laughs> in films. Never even thought about being in movies. I, was, I started doing martial arts when I was 12 years old. And that was on the back of doing um, the Duke of Edinburgh Awards. So I was doing like the Duke of Edinburgh stuff, you know, Boy Scout stuff. And um, there was this one particular thing they said you had to have a hobby. Yeah. And, I didn't have and um, just so happens that at the bottom of my road where I used to live, they opened a martial arts studio and started teaching martial arts there. I didn't know what martial arts was. So I thought, I'll go down there, go and check it out and see what it was like. And I went down there fell in love with the martial arts straight away you know what i mean as the start was it so from the age of 12 i got into the martial arts and uh at the age of 17 i took off to america and um entered the us open i was one of the youngest people ever to win it and oh, uh yeah. fantastic i spent two and a half years out in the, in, uh, in florida teaching and studying and then i came back to the uk opened up my first gym and started teaching full-time as a martial arts instructor for for 10 years or so before getting yeah. caught by um, Philip, Philip Coe and Jackie Chan to go off to Hong Kong to make my first movie. Madness. Uh, what was it like getting the first call, especially with like Jackie Chan and stuff? Because that's such a historical name in martial arts as well as film. Yeah. The thing about it, it was really sort of like, it's quite strange how it all happened is because I was actually teaching and uh, teaching martial arts. And I, was, I used to go to Cyprus and Greece and I had uh, different organizations uh, from the same martial arts system that I study. That yeah. was, yeah, so I used to go as a, a traveling instructor and I'd go and teach their schools and do seminars. And it was on one of these seminars that I was teaching. Uh, I, and so I went to Greece and then we flew on to Cyprus and I was out in Cyprus teaching a seminar. And while I was there, it just so happens, I was on the beach one night trying to think about, because I'd been, competed a, a number of times as full contact fighting and I was decided, well, got to retire from the ring now. I don't want to do this anymore. And I'm on the beach one night and this little, I remember this little Chinese guy comes up to me and his name was um, Simon Yam. Mm -hmm. And he walks up to me and says, hey, my boss wants to meet you. And um, I was like, okay. And he took me back into a hotel and there was sat Philip Coe and Jackie Chan. And it was like, what? <laughs> These are two <laughs> class heroes of my time, you know what I mean? Why used to go to martial arts, watch, watch these guys in martial arts movies. And um, they offered me an opportunity to fly out to Hong Kong to make my first picture. So yeah. Six, six weeks later, I was in on a plane to Hong Kong making my first movie, and that's how it all started from there. That's crazy, because um, I did my Duke of Edinburgh, and I did kickboxing for it, so that's how I got into doing my sports. <laughs> <laughs> the, the irony of it all, man, I tell you. <laughs> you went over to, obviously, do the, the, the first film, obviously, because you've been in a ring before fighting, but then fighting on a scene, putting the choreography together, do you find it quite easy and natural? Or was it a bit difficult not actually hitting people for real? It was a nightmare. It was, a, <laughs> it was an absolute nightmare because, as you know, as a fighter yourself, you know, you know when, you're, when you're fighting in the ring against someone full contact, 
there's no sort of like exaggerated movements or whatever. It's all direct. You know, you're just trying to get to that point. You know, I mean, full contact straight on. And you're looking at the straightest point and uh, to make contact with the person and whatever. So it was, but when you're going to film set, everything's got to be exaggerated. Everything's got to be overplayed, you know, and you're trained to miss and pull. And I remember when I was first on the set, no one wanted to, <laughs> I remember the first couple of days on a film set and I had to fight with a couple of the extra, a couple of the stunt guys. And they were like, oh, no, 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 no. Because I was actually, everything, all my, even my blocks were so heavy. Everything was so solid. And it took me a long time before I started sort of to adapt. I was able to try and get into the way of like, you know, big exaggerated punches, big exaggerated kicks and the techniques, how to pull everything, do you know what I mean? So it took yeah. me a while. Most of it did take a while. But um, the Hong Kong way of choreographing fight sequences is just completely different to, I think it was fantastic for me to do it that way because in Hong Kong, they, 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 they do a whole lot of moves together. So you do like 10, 15, 20, 30 different combinations of movements. Whereas back then, back in the 80s, in Western type movies, in Western type films, you'd do one, two, three, and that'd be it. One, two, three, that'd be it. A throw, a punch, block, kick, whatever, and that's it. You know what I mean? Whereas you'd learn to do all these numerous combinations of techniques and they filmed everything wide angle. So yeah. you had, it was just like, you know, you had to get it right. You had to get it right. It was continuous movement. So I, that's where I developed the skill. So by the time I came back to the UK and got into the British way of making movies or Western way of making movies, so to speak, I was well adapted to the way in which they were working. So it was like, I was like, God, this is basic. I can do this. It's easy. You know what I mean? Compared to what I would be, you know what I mean? Because they don't pull in, they, they don't mess about in Hong Kong. It was all real weapons, all real stuff. The stunts were real. You know what I mean? The, some of the stuff you see Jackie do, especially back in the 80s, you know, it was, they're real. There was no messing around with it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so what was the most craziest prop you got to use over there? Like the realest weapon? Was there something you held in your hand? You thought this is proper dangerous, this like... <laughs> Yeah, we did a few fight scenes. I did this, um, we did this uh, fight scene with a guy called Mark Houghton, who's a, a number one martial artist. He's a, a big actor. From, he's actually from um, the UK. And he moved to Hong Kong back in the 70s. And he's been living out there ever since. Uh, actually, they called him, his nickname is White Tiger because he's been out there for so long. He's more <laughs> Chinese than anything else, you know what I mean? And we were doing, he was choreographing a fight scene that we were in together uh, for a big demonstration we were doing. And um, it was with swords. And um, real swords, and I was thinking to myself, hold on a minute, this is like, there's like 30, 40 moves, like, blah, blah, blah. and I'm thinking the faster we're going, I'm thinking, this is dangerous. It's like one little, and it's like lights out. And just so happens that he did this technique and I went to block it and the sword went straight in the back of my hand. Oh, the... nice. <laughs> but yeah, and I've still got that scar to this day. So I remember that, Mark, I owe you one. <laughs> <laughs> So did you get to do much stunt work over there or uh, were you quite new to stunt work as well, obviously being over there? Yes, I did get to. The thing is, whenever you work on, on martial arts and action movies in Hong Kong, it really is. You're, you're a stunt guy who knows how to act. Do you know what I mean? Because basically they sh your, your fight action, they show you all the fight action, the moves. I was jumping out of windows, going through pane glass windows because they had this special... I don't know if they call it sugar glass or whatever, and they used to put little sticks of um, little pieces of um, dynamite charge in it, so that when you were going to go through it, they would set the charge off and it'd break, and then you just smash through it, so it'd be a lot softer going through. And one of the funniest things that ever happened to me, which is I still owe the scars in the back of my head to this day, I was doing a fight sequence with Gary Daniels, great martial artist, and um, they had this big pane of glass, and they had all the dynamite charges in there. And basically they had the, the guy who was doing the pyrotechnics, he was from LA. Yeah. But it was from Hong Kong. And he didn't speak Cantonese and he didn't speak English. <laughs> <laughs> the director was like, okay, go. And this guy just set the charge off. So by the time he set the charge off, we'd already gone. So we yeah. actually hit the glass full on and then it exploded. Do you know what I mean? And there's glass everywhere. Do you know what I mean? But it was like, Gary came out without a scratch and I had all these little bits of, glass in the back of my head <laughs> so, <laughs> so but the thing is i learned about hong kong movies is that you you know these guys they they put their bodies through it believe me the stunts are real the action is real i saw there was a scene i don't know if you've ever seen there's a movie one of, one of jackie's films where he's on a double-decker bus and a guy falls off from the double-decker bus and lands on the ground yeah now 
thing about it is one of the guys was killed doing that. But oh, what really? they were, one of the one of these a lot of stunt guys get really seriously injured and hurt out there doing these things. And what they would do is they would cut, they would dig a hole in the ground and put a mattress and just cover it over with dirt. And that's <laughs> you know, and that was it. Or cardboard boxes, you know what I mean? And that was it. That was that was the safety measure. There was nothing else. And I used to say to myself, this is crazy. You're jumping from a double decker bus and you gotta hit this square. That's the size of a mat. It was a mattress. It was a, it was a, it was a mattress, and that's it. And that was all you had to land on. So you know these guys didn't mess about out there, believe me. Because I mean, you mentioned Jackie Chan's name, but you also got to work alongside Jet Li as well, which is another big name. In, was it the yeah. Quest you did? I know I did the Quest with Jean Claude Van Damme. Jean, I said Jean Claude Van Damme. Sorry. Yeah, and I did uh, Black Mask with Jet Li, and um, that was a, an amazing experience. I have never ever come across a martial artist like him. He is, the man is phenomenal. Yeah. His speed, his power, his accuracy. You know, I just can't say enough about him. I remember we were filming and uh, my daughter at the time was being born in the UK and I was actually in Hong Kong. And we were on a rooftop and we were filming Black, uh, Black Mask and uh, they had all these fire hydrants on. It was in midnight and they had these fire hydrants on to make it look like it was raining. And we're doing this fight sequence over and over and over again. And uh, I get a phone call and it was like, your daughter's been born. And so I was like, oh my God, I'm a father. I'm like, oh, we've got a little baby girl. And they, they stood just stop production. And we ended up having a couple of glasses of champagne in between <laughs> takes. And then we went right back to it. But I remember there was this one time where he had this, he had a cup and he was showing me this move and he had a coffee, he had coffee in his cup and he was showing me this move. And he said, oh, I want you to throw this punch. When you throw this punch, I'm going to jump up and I'm going to, uh, punch your punch and then I was like okay and then he goes go go do it and I'm like but he's got his coffee in his hand and I'm not kidding you I threw the punch as fast as I could and this guy just jumped backwards in the air with his coffee in his hand and just punched my hand <laughs> thinking he's not a human being <laughs> it's like he's like he's like a, like a I've never seen anybody do it he is just so amazing in his abilities and it really sort of made me switch on to the amount of dedication that it takes you know, for, that they must go through the training, the drilling and the training day in and day out. So their bodies become just, you know, it's, it's like second memory to them, you know? But it's did amazing. You, did you find, obviously, Jackie Chan and Jet Li, did they have diff quite different methods or were they quite similar on set? You find that the styles, the similar styles of, 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 of um, creating the fight sequences, do you know what I mean? Uh, but the thing is, it's very similar. The, the, the Hong Kong way of doing things is very straightforward, very similar. And um, they, they all try to outdo each other with the bigger, bigger fight sequences, bigger stunts and whatever. But the basics are the same. But um, I never got to fight against Jackie, but I got to fight against Jet. Yeah. And working against Jet, I was just thinking, I've never, I've never competed against, I've never done anything like that with anybody like that. It's, it's just his speed and accuracy, as I said, his kicks were, you move and his kicks are already by your face. You know what I mean? Literally. And you're supposed to, do you know what I mean? I'm like, I didn't even see it coming. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So, but that guy was just incredibly fast and incredibly powerful as well. So, yeah, that was one of the best experiences of my life. And I realized then that if I want to stay in the game, I'm going to have to step it up a level, you know? So did but, you find you got a lot of acting work when you come back to the UK? Did things really start to blow up then for you? It was, funny enough, it was kind of strange because um, in Hong Kong, I spent 10 years in Hong Kong. And I made about 36 films out there, you know, just constantly making movies. And it was, I was, I was one of the only black men, in fact, I was the only black guy doing martial arts in Hong Kong at that time. And so I was constantly, I, I get a phone call, we want you on this movie. I never had to cast for anything. It was just, I was constantly working. Sometimes I'll be doing two or three movies in a month. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. When I came back to the UK, everything changed. <laughs> <'Cause> I remember... <laughs> I remember I got an agent from, um, I got, um, I worked on a film called The Quest. That was the last movie I did out in Asia. And the director was a guy called Peter McDonald, and he had directed the Rambo trilogy. Nice. And it turned out that he was from Caversham in Reading, where I was born, where I'm from. And he said to me, look, I'm going to introduce you to an agent in the UK, because it was getting to 1997, and Hong Kong was getting handed back to China. And so a lot of the Westerners were moving out. So I was planning to come home and uh, he, he got me an agent back in the UK and I got back here, got the agent. And my first job was a Coca-Cola commercial. 
And I remember thinking, I was quite big headed, I was thinking, crack, I've been working 10 years in Hong Kong, I'm getting everything, you know what I mean? I'm the only man doing this, you know? And I'm in the spotlight in Leicester Square and um, for the casting. And I remember walking in the door, and as I walked in the door, this room was just packed solid with black guys that looked just like me. <laughs> it's good. It was like, I remember this thinking it's Idris Al, but it was, it was all these different, David Hayward, all these different big black actors that have been doing stuff for years. And I'm thinking, wow, I'm gonna have to really work now. Do you know what I mean? Because <laughs> over here, was, I find it much more difficult to get work in the UK than when I was working out in Asia. And at that time, you're, you know, we didn't, you know, you didn't get those kind of roles that you really wanted because back in the 80s and 90s and even early parts of the 2000s, there wasn't really good roles for black actors. Any not really good diverse roles. It was either a bodyguard, a killer, a drug dealer, whatever. It was either those are the kind of roles you got. And um, over the last five years or so, you think, as you've seen things have changed a lot more now, where now you've got a lot more diversity in the film industry and a lot more actors are diver and a lot more um uh ethnic actors are getting bigger roles and been leading roles back in the day we never had that you know we never really got those opportunities so i always say to whenever i worried idris i always say you came along at the right time idris man <laughs> you, know what I mean? you came along just the right time <laughs> yeah he's, he's landed quite a few big roles recently hasn't he i mean he was in hobson shaw and he's his luther's blowing up big time at the minute yeah luther was his signature i think that was his signature piece to be honest with you, you know, a lot of people say you know, it was Mandela and the different things. He's a great actor, a very talented, very charismatic actor. And his timing is perfect. I think that's got to do with his DJing. His timing is just so on point. But mm -hmm. um, Luther, I think he developed that character and he made that. That's, that's always going to be what I think he's going to be remembered for because it was just such a brilliant, brilliant bit of writing, directing, and his, his acting in it was just amazing. So mm -hmm. I really like the character. Well, I was like, because I actually tried for the part. I actually wanted I cast it for that. <laughs> oh, really nice. that, that. What happened when you went for that? I didn't get it, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the thing is, he was right for that. Is there's no one else for it. You know, there's certain it's like they say, you know, when, when I first when I did Pirates of the Caribbean, and everybody everybody sort of identifies pirates now with Johnny Depp. But a yeah. lot of people don't realize that Tom Cruise was supposed to play the part. He was actually supposed to be. That was he was offered Tom Cruise first, and I think it was Brad Pitt. I think even Nicolas Cage got a look in for that for that role, and they didn't want Johnny. And Johnny brought that whole different feeling to that whole that whole different um, character, and they really didn't like it at first. But once they saw it and they saw the, the, the reaction to it, you know, it's it's history now. You know, the rest of the day is history. He made it his own. And had had you seen the first couple of the parts of the Caribbean before you auditioned? For your part, no, I was actually um, I was actually out in South Africa and I was shooting a TV commercial, a crunchy nut cornflakes TV TV commercial, and I got a phone call from my agent and she said to me, um, "They want to cast you in Pirates of the Caribbean," and I hadn't seen the first one because it was only they, only they only had made one at that point, hmm. and I hadn't seen the movie, but they said it was a pirate movie, and I was thinking, nah, I'm not going to do it because you know pirate movie, I'm a black guy, I'm going to get whipped, I'm going to be a slave. <laughs> building the front scenes and so I thought no nope, I'm not going to do it so I turned it down uh, I remember I got back to the UK and um, I remember my daughter had rented the DVD the video the, the VHS tape at the time and I watched it and I remember seeing that scene of Johnny walking off the sinking ship onto the deck and I remember thinking this is going to be big and I remember call, I called up and I said look can I get back on the film there's a chance of me getting a casting. And she's like, no, there's no chance. It was closed down. It was all done. And I thought to myself, you know, it was meant, wasn't meant to be because unfortunately I had caught laryngitis. I got, because of coming from South Africa back to the UK, I got a really bad cold. I couldn't even talk properly. So I thought maybe it's a blessing in disguise. About three days later, I get a phone call from her and she says, they want to see you in Soho and they want to do this, in this casting via satellite. Mm -hmm. And they've got this character that they've developed for you called Polifico. And I was like, wow, but I can't even talk. And she was like, you have to go. This is a big opportunity. So I remember got my coat on, got the scarf on, headed off up to London. And I walked in and there's this big flat screen TV and there are Gore Babinski, Jerry Bruckheimer, Johnny, they're all on this thing and casting director. And they, they were like, um, so you say this one line and it's the captain goes down with his ship. And I was like, the captain goes down with his ship. And they were like, absolutely. <laughs> and they were like, three picture deal. 
So I got three picture deal from it. So I ended up doing two back to back and I'm still owed to do one more. I'm still contracted to do one more if they ever decide to do it. Yeah, I mean, but, obviously with, with the Johnny case and stuff, it's all a bit up in the air a little bit at the minute, oh, isn't it? Well, <laughs> It's not going to do it, but I think, you know, I think the powers that be, I think it will happen. I think the final one will happen because there is one more installment to do. And it's where they all come together, finally, all the big, all the old characters come together. And I think they need to do that to finish it off, you know? So you've, got, you've got some amazing airtime in those films. Right? So what was it like working alongside Johnny Depp and your first days on set, seeing it all set up, especially with CGI coming, how it's come so far forward now? Yeah, that was the toughest part for me, to be honest with you, because when I turned, they were saying, you know, you're going to be a pirate, Winston. And so I'm thinking, you're going to get dressed up and all the gear and all that kind of bit. And um, I'm getting excited about it. And they flew us out to L.A. and they even dressed us as pirates for the promotional shoots in L.A. And then we went off to the Bahamas, ran the Bahamas for 18 months. And when we landed in the Bahamas, first day on set, I remember they gave us these grey pyjama suits, these little baubles on them. And I'm thinking... What's all this about? <laughs> you know, what I mean? you know, like this is what you'll be wearing for the next eighteen months. <laughs> There's no pirate or what's that? No costumes, whatever. This. And I'm like, how am I supposed to act like a pirate walking around this lycra, bloody jumpsuit kind of thing? Do you know what I mean? It was like, and it was not very flattering, believe me, because like these things were tight. And <laughs> you're in the Bahamas, <laughs> and um, so yeah, we had to get used to doing all the movements. But when you saw it in the studio afterwards and you saw it on the rushes, mm. and you saw your characters, it kind of, you thought, wow, that's amazing. Because that time, I still couldn't get understand how that technology worked. And like you say, it was very new. CGI was, I think Pirates was one of the first productions that they really used CGI so much on. And uh, if I remember rightly, they were saying it's costing them 50000 a day Ooh. for on Pirates of the Caribbean. That's how much it was costing to shoot us every single day. And being out there for 18 months, you can imagine, that's a lot of production money. <laughs> <laughs> but it was an amazing, it was, a, it was absolutely an amazing experience to work with those guys and to see the difference between working on a Hong Kong production and then working on a, a, on a Western production, it was just like a huge difference. Because whereas in Hong Kong, it was just a case of you just did it, you get on with it. There was no, I remember we shot a movie called Cypress Tigers in Cyprus. And um, it was, I was with Philip Coe, Simon Young. Um, uh, there was, um, I forgot his name now, Craigie. Uh, um, Le Yun, I keep, I keep calling him by his Chinese name, Conan Lee. And a few other big names were in this movie. And the scene was that, um, I, that I'm chasing them through the streets of Cyprus, Limassol. And they jump onto a bus. And I pull out, I've got these two guns, and I pull out these two guns, and I you know, try to stop, try, stop, stop the bus from going. And literally, I'm done this scene, and all of a sudden, all these police turn up, this South Pacific police, and they pull out real guns. And <laughs> they hadn't got permission to do it. They just basically hijacked this bus and shot this scene in the middle of the streets in Limassol. Because it was the way they did it in Hong Kong, it was cheaper for them to pay the fine than it was for them to turn around and pay for, you know, the, all the, the, go for all the legal ramifications of actually getting permission to film in the streets. And I was like, you guys almost got me killed. <laughs> I've got a fake, I've got real guns. <laughs> so yeah, it was it was a turnaround. It was a massive turnaround for me. So obviously in Pirates of the Caribbean, you obviously there's a lot of fighting scenes and sword fighting scenes. Did you get to use a pirate sword? And was that different to using like a sword in martial arts? How they how you fight those scenes? Yeah, working on the pirates, uh, it was we did get to use swords. But thankfully, their swords were fake. You know, they were not, they were not real swords, they were rubber swords, not like in Hong Kong. And the movements were very sort of like um, linear, as I'd say, very much sort of like, ah, there's more noises and sort of big movements. But my character was more like you grab hold of people and threw them places, you know, and so I very rarely use swords. So there's a couple of scenes where you see me grab different characters, pick them up and throw them off the ship, you know what I mean? And that's why it hit people and throw them off ships and stuff like that, because of, at the time, I was weighing at nearly 18 stone back then. So they, they said, yeah, I remember Gore Verbinski turning and saying, yeah, we're just going to have you. You're going to be cool. You're going to be one of these guys who just, just grabs people and throws them out of the way and just that kind of stuff. And you're very weird. Whenever time you pull your sword out, that's a business. That means business. You know what I mean? So most of my stuff was hand to hand. But it was amazing, amazing to do, I must admit. It was a fantastic experience. 
But the, the people you were throwing about, were they all wired up or did they want you to use your brute strength to throw them? Yeah, most of it was brute strength because the thing is, it was a couple of guys that I threw just with my brute strength and I threw them off and there was no wires involved. And um, it was quite, the way it was, the safety measures was just amazing compared to what we did in Asia. You know what I mean? Because like they had, I was throwing these guys off the ship and uh, even though it was a barge and it was quite high, they had divers in the water and security guys and they all could be in the water. So as soon as these guys went in, they were out, they were, they were out straight away. But it was just such a way to see how much more tech care they put into looking after the actors, the stunt guys. And even for me to jump off a table that was only maybe a foot high, they were like, do you want to get a stunt double? I was like, no, I don't need a stunt double for that. I can do it myself. I'm like, well, get your stunt double. I'm like, I don't need one. I'm thinking, I've been working in Hong Kong where I've been jumping out of two-story buildings. <laughs> you know I mean? But then you weren't allowed to. You know, in, in, in American films and stuff, it was very difficult to, to be able to allow, they, they didn't really allow you to do your own stunts. They kind of put pressured you to use stunt because of the insurances and stuff, but that was too high. You hired as an actor, that's what you did. Yeah. And if you have power, you could turn and say, listen, I can do this and I can probably do it better than some of the stunt guys. And so I started to build a bit of a reputation for myself in the fact that I could actually perform. And so from that, I went on to helping out, working on other projects like Penny Dreadful, where I was a fight choreographer and also a stunt guy. And just recently, uh, Fast and the Furious 10 and a few other things like um, Moonhaven and a few others like that. So in the industry, I've got a name for being a bit of both, really, if that makes any sense. <laughs> So can you talk about the Fast and Furious Tale, or is it still too early to talk about that? I can talk about it now because uh, they had the premiere in Rome yesterday, <laughs> on yeah. Friday. But Friday was the big premiere in Rome, I think. And so I suppose I can talk about it now, but it was, uh, that was an incredible film to be on as well. Um, you know, seeing all those guys and seeing the production, the, the size of the production on it is just amazing, you know? Um, I can't tell you too much about my scenes until I suppose it's shown over here, but... I play one of, I play a very bad guy in that. Very, very, a very good character. Very nice. You'll see. When you, I'll, leave, I'll leave it to you when you see it. You'll see yourself. But um, there's some really good scenes in there for myself. A yeah. couple of good sequences. There's a little bit, a nice little bit of dialogue. It's not a big scene. It's not big scenes, but they're nice little, for that kind of a movie, for me, that was a nice platform. Do you know what I mean? It was a yeah. nice thing to do something on that level. You know, so, um, but um, working on a production that big was just amazing. It was just absolutely amazing because it is in multi, you know, hundreds of millions they put into that. The thing that upset me the most was seeing the cars and the cars that they wrecked on that movie set. <laughs> you know what I mean? You got <laughs> fantastic, amazing supercars in the world and they were just wrecking them. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> Incredible. So were they destroying cars like on the Blues Brothers? There's a lot of CGI cars get blown up. So were they proper just destroying things on set then? Both. Both. Both, you know, there's a lot of cars that were set, you know, you see cars getting flipped and that wasn't CGI, that was real cars, cars getting bullet holes in them and stuff like that. I'm thinking, wow, those are, that's a brand new Lambo, that's a brand new Ferrari or whatever the case may be. You guys are drilling holes in it and making bullet holes and they're blowing up and flipping over. I'm thinking, no, oh. you know what I mean? I'm thinking, can't you just, when you finish with it, just give me the wreck. I'll take the wreck. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? But um, yeah, it's incredible. That, there's one of the things that I saw and I thought to myself, wow, I just, you can't just, you can't imagine that, that, that there would, there's must be other ways of doing it, I thought, maybe CGI or whatever you say, but they used the real deal. They really went for the real deal on this stuff. And the Vin cast, Diesel. yeah. I Sorry? I say Vin Diesel, Vin Diesel dropped a bit of a bombshell at the Rome one. He said it was going to be a three part episode. That's what I've heard. I don't know how true that is because this was this was um, Fast and the Furious 10. But apparently what they've done is, like they did in Pirates, where they've shot like two movies back to back. So when I did number two of Pirates of the Caribbean, they really shot two films back to back. So we did two and three in, in one. Mm -hmm. And that's what they've done on the Fast and the Furious. So it's in two segments. So there's 10 and apparently it will be 11 that will come out, but they've shot the whole thing already apparently. So. I don't know how that true that is because with that with that production it has changed so many times. I think they had like something like three different directors on the project, you know. So it, it was the script changes and everything that was changed on it so much. But as I say, it was an incredible cast. You know, you're, you're on set with some of some of these biggest Hollywood A-listers and some of the most incredible stunt performers in the world. 
you know, Pete Miles, one of the best fight coordinators in the world, uh, producers, fight choreographers. You've got Ray Nicholas, amazing fight choreographer. And they had the best, the best on that project, I have to say. So it was, oh, it was. So obviously going back to one of your um, earlier films, you got to be in The Dark Knight as well. Yes, yes. Um, obviously, because you're, you're in a couple of scenes of that. So what's the first scene that you're in on The Dark Knight? The first, actually, the first scene was in the, um, we, the <laughs> that's another strange story because I was actually filming Pirates of the Caribbean and they'd given us, there was a hurricane in the Bahamas because what happened was they were filming James Bond, the first one with Daniel Craig at the same time we were doing Pirates in Bahamas. And I got a phone call um, to say, would you like to come on to, we want you to do a fight sequence and stuff like that with Daniel Craig on, on um, the Bond movie. And as I was out already out there, I thought, fantastic. So I asked the powers that be, can I get on this? And they were like, nope, nope, nope. You're under contract with us. We're not letting you do it. And I was so gutted because I couldn't get in the movie. But as it turned out, there's this massive hurricane in the, in the Bahamas. So they flew everybody home. And when we came home, as soon as I landed, my agent said, listen, they, they're asking if you want to do uh, a week on Batman with Heath Ledger. I was like, hell yeah. <laughs> and there was... Sure. Um, in the Haymarket in London. And we went to this place called the IO, the IO, I think it's IOU Club in London. And it was in the basement. They had a snooker table in there. And that's where we shot the first scenes with Heath Ledger. And I remember in between takes, he was, he, this guy was just amazing. He was such a funny young man because he's only a couple of years older than my son. And I remember there were, he was doing all these little tricks in between takes, you know, and he had these coins, you know those coin tricks where you put the coins on here and you catch the coins. And he had about three or four coins. And I was like, ah, oh, I'll show you. And I piled the load up there and I caught them. And that made us start talking. And we just started chatting and having a great time. And as soon as um, the director said, okay, when you get back to shooting, the transformation of this man, it was scary. And if you watch this scene where he looks down, he says, why so serious to me? You see my face. That's real fear, because I'm looking at this guy, I'm thinking, I was just talking to you, and you were really nice. <laughs> <laughs> and now there's this look on it, it, it it's, it's, it's hard to explain, but his whole aura changed. He really, really embraced that character. And I found myself at some sometimes just like, you know, you forget you're on a film set, and you think you're watching a movie yourself, because you're in awe of this actor. And sometimes I sat there like, and they'd be like, Winston, I'm like, oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, yeah, I have to remember I'm doing my, I've got to do my own character. <laughs> I'm not watching this, you know what I mean? You kind of remember, you have to forget because he's such a talented actor. So, I mean, the dialogue in that scene's fantastic because that's when he first talks about his scars and the fact right. he asks you why you're being so serious before he kills your boss. I mean, right. I mean, did you know those words were coming or did they keep what he was going to say a secret? No, we had the script and we had our sides and so I knew what was going to be said. And that's what made it even more amazing because you know what's coming. Do you know what I mean? But the fact is, when he turns it on, you just think it was just like this amazing presence that came over him. And you kind of, I remember the first couple of times I was like, am I supposed to say something or just react? Because like, I was just in awe of him. And there was no dialogue for me in that scene, but they, they, they wanted to focus on my face because... I remember Christopher Nolan saying, you, know, you look so scared. And I was like, that's because I was. <laughs> because we <laughs> will capture that, do it again. I'm like, it's real. <laughs> that's, not, that's not fake. I'm not faking it. I said, this guy really did, it, it, the way in which he stared at me, it was like he stared straight through me. It made me feel my character more, you know, brought it out in me. So it was amazing to do it. But what a wonderful man to work with. I mean, because your character, you get given one of the pool cues to fight your way out of. So do you right. think you, would you have taken the two other guys and done them in and joined the other side? That's what happened. But they cut that scene. Because you, you should have seen that because basically what happens is that we break the snooker, that he breaks the snooker cue in half and he throws it down. And then we sort of, he goes, um, I can only have space for one of you. And what happens is I remember is um, uh, Chucky Venn, Charles, Charles Venn, who is what he worked with me. And he goes for it. I grab his hand, grab the cue and I go, <laughs> stab him in the back with it. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Thing got cut anyway, so but the fact is, I was like, "Don't I get to survive?" <laughs> but they didn't use us any longer in that. They just used us for that week, and that was it. And then the next scene was with the famous pencil scene in the um in the uh the uh, the kitchen area. Yeah, bad guys around the table, 
and then have the pencil scene there. And that was that, that was my second scene in the picture. And it was the last time I saw Heath actually, because we were supposed to, he was actually living, he was actually staying in New York and I was flying out to New York. And so we had arranged to meet in New York when I got out there because we got along so well on the set. And I was literally getting on a plane. I swear to God, I was getting on a plane to go to New York. And I had a phone call from an Australian radio station. And they were like, um, we'd like to hear what your views are on the death of Heath Ledger. And I'm like, what do you mean? He's not dead. I was just working with the guy. He was just literally working with him. He can't be dead. He's like, yeah, he died of an overdose. I'm like, and I was, so you can imagine, get on a plane now to fly to New York. And I'm sitting there for seven and a half, eight hours on a plane thinking, what happened? You know, what yeah. the hell? You know what I mean? It's crazy. It's crazy time. I mean, the, the basement scene that you guys are in, again, like it's the, the dialogue for it, the whole setup of building up Heath's character. But yeah. have you ever noticed fans have compared that to a scene that was in The Crow as well? Yes, I've heard that a few times, actually. And the thing is, people have always had these conspiracy theories about the fact that there was, you know, that he, they, he got so deep into it, that's what affected him. There's nothing like that at all. He was just a very, very talented actor. And he really sort of like, he, he, he really embedded himself in the character, but his death had nothing to do with that character. And I know a lot of people try to make conspiracies and comparisons between that and The Crow. They said the same thing about The Crow, but it, it was nothing to do with that. They both were, what happened to Heath was an unfortunate accident. And what happened to Brandon Lee, again, was an unfortunate accident. It's one that could and should have been avoided on Brandon's case, but it was an accident. It had nothing to do with, you know, curses and all kinds of stuff. It had nothing to do with that. So obviously seeing Heath for the first time in full makeup and full gear, or had you seen him prior to that? So when he first came onto set? I only ever saw Heath in his full makeup. And the funny thing about it is a lot of people don't realise this, but he would actually, they, they gave him this, he kind of looked like the Grim Reaper. They gave him this big, and this big cape thing like this, so he looked like a Grim Reaper. And he would actually go out in the middle of Haymarket, sat there and smoke a smoke cigarettes. And no one noticed it was him. <laughs> and the people would be walking past the street, and he'd be done up as the Joker, but he had this big hood and thing like he'd sit outside smoking cigarettes, and people walking by, and no, that was him. I mean, someone's trying to call me. Can you believe this? <laughs> <laughs> is, it interrupting the, is it interrupting this? No, no, it's fine. It's still going. I can't hear anything. I think, no, I'm, apologies. But um, yes, I'm um, really happy. He was actually dressed as a Grim Reaper. I remember when I saw him, I was thinking, I didn't even realize it was him. I didn't realize it was him. And they were like, he goes, Yeah, I go out there every day. I walk up and down the streets, walk around that Haymarket area in London. No one knew it was him. And because it was like, I think it was nearly Halloween time anyway, there was a lot of people all dressed up in it. So no one took a blindest bit of notice. <laughs> but yeah, really, really good times there. Really good times. Because I, I recently spoke to Martin Ballantyne because he was on, on the set of The Dark Knight and he said yeah. they had to smuggle them in and off set like in a bus with hoods on and things. Did you have the same sort of treatment? <laughs> I didn't get that kind of treatment because obviously I wasn't one of the main cast. So basically we got, they actually, we got, um, I was with um, uh, Charles Venn, as I said, and also we, we worked in a very tight group. And so what they did was we shipped, they shipped us in in the morning. We got changed in, in, the, in the actual on location. And when we finished, we got changing and shipped us back out again. But we weren't the big talent. But I saw how they did with um, Heath and, and with um, Christian. I saw how they did them. They, they basically, it was all very, very hush hush secret. No one knew what was going on there. You know, so yeah, I, I saw that go on. Cool. And looking a, a little bit further back in your career, I mean, you're on quite a big British kids TV show as well, Chuckle Vision. Oh, jeez. I knew I know what about that, because... <laughs> I... I knew you were going to bring that up. I don't know, you know, that's one of the things that I have to laugh about because my daughter, she was very young at the time. And I had taken her down to the local theatre, you know, in, in, in Reading where I was born. And they had like um, the pantomime stuff going on and the Chocolate Brothers were doing pantomime at the time. And my daughter was, she a massive fan at the time. And she was like, Daddy, you should work with the Chocolate Brothers. And I was like, yeah, okay, Daddy, work with the Chocolate Brothers. I'm never going to happen. And about a few weeks later, I get this casting, Chocker Brothers, and I'm thinking, ah, oh, and I've got to do it. <laughs> and the thing is, I know for a dustbin, this, this whole to me, to you, to me, to you. <laughs> it, was a, it was a funny experience. We had a really, really great time. 
And I didn't realize how huge how hugely popular these these characters were and this TV series were because we actually shot that that whole that whole episode in a street in Richmond and it was near a school there was a school not very far from where we were shooting and the kids the, 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 the crowd around the area after school and just like shout, shout out all the character names and stuff and I was thinking I never realized it was that popular to be honest with you it was such a popular TV series it was really funny to do that. I must admit, I did enjoy doing it. So looking back over your career, was there anything that you come across that you found really challenging, that really sort of pushed you to your limits as far as acting or fighting or stunt work? Well, the stunt work, I think working in Asia, that really pushed me to my limits as, as a performer, as a martial artist. Um, and really, you know, I, lo I love... I love doing sort of like scary things, you know, skydiving, parachuting and stuff like that. But, you know, as an adrenaline junkie, if you really want to, if you really want to test your metal, you go out to Asia and you try stuff out like there because they go to the limits. They do the limits out there. So it was really challenging. But I remember when I worked on the quest and even though it was a big acting role, I remember sitting down with Roger Moore. I had the, the real honor to sit down with him. And, um, we were talking about acting and I was saying, do you think I should go to acting school and take up acting? Because I've never been to acting class in my life. And he said to me, no. He said, why would you do that? He goes, you know, you're, you're doing so well without it. You know, you, you pull on life experiences and you make them real. You've been there, you've done that. So you can bring it to the screen and bring it alive. And that's what's getting you work. So why change it? Why reinvent the wheel? Stick with what you know. And so that's what I've really continued to do throughout my whole career. And I'm um, just taking it my time, take my time. And I've chosen roles that I feel that I can really give something to, you know. And um, so I've been very fortunate. And that's why these, I suppose, these last four films that I'm doing now, the two TV shows and the films I'm doing at the moment, I'm able to bring a lot more to those characters because I'm bringing my life experiences to them. So it has been a lot better for me. I mean, and also looking at all the actors you've got to work with over the years, is there someone that you really nerded out by and sort of fangirled when you got to work with them? Anyone come to mind that sort of way? I was really sort of, like I became a big fan over, you mean? Like yeah. I was like, Roger Moore, I gotta say, you know, the, the thing about it is I know that there's, um, I've got, I can't really talk about it because it hasn't been confirmed yet, but uh, everyone knows that Gladiator 2 is actually in production at the moment. And uh, Denzel Washington is rumoured to be on that. And he's my hero. He's like my, he's like the main man for me. Getting the opportunity to work with him would be fantastic. But working with Roger Moore, that was an experience that I will never forget because I grew up in a household where the Saint and James Bond, he was like a huge, my mom and dad, they were big fans. And then to be able to work with him all those years later and to sit down and talk, because we spent six months together in the Philippines, in, in um, Thailand, you know, shooting that movie. And what an incredible human being, such a down-to-earth man, very giving, full of information, full of so much, he gave you so much of his time. You know, he was just one of the, he just acted, one of, and I, I just, I absolutely loved the man, absolutely loved the man, really, truly. So it was an honor to work with him. And you know they say you never want to meet your hero, you know what I mean? But I was really happy to meet with him. It was a real pleasure to meet with him. It was like, I never, I had no, no regrets, no regrets at all about meeting him. Awesome. And um, obviously, looking back at all the scenes and fight scenes and movies you've been in, is there something that really sticks out that you're really proud of that you got to do and you, you still think, you know, I can't believe I got to do that scene? That's a good question. That's a very good question, actually. Um, I think one of the things that I really sort of like that stands out in my mind is getting the opportunity to fight with Conan Lee and Jet Li as well in Hong Kong. Because, again... As a kid growing up and doing martial arts, you know, they had to used to have the late night cinemas on a Friday night and they have all the Chinese martial arts movies. So you used to watch all these guys on, on this on a big screen, you know, Conan Lee, Ninja and the Dragon Den, and, and all these different actors, you know what I mean? And being able to fly out to Hong Kong and meet these guys in person and then actually fight them on a film scene and, and a big movie. So you now are in a big film with these guys. That was just, that was mind blowing for me because I watched them when I was a teenager. And then as a 30 year old adult, I'm actually fighting against these same guys, you know what I mean? Uh, the likes of Conan Lee and 
Jet Li and Jean-Claude Van Damme. It was like, wow, how did this happen? So yeah, that, that was an amazing, that was an amazing experience for me. So one of the ways I found you and obviously booked you today, I, I got hold of you through social media because you've got quite a few social media platforms. Is there ones that people can follow you on? Do you have good people to follow you on Instagram and Facebook? Yeah, I have an Instagram page. I have Facebook page. I have Twitter and I have TikTok now. I have to admit, though, I'm useless at social media. <laughs> I'm constantly getting it from my, my agent, from people. Oh, you should do more on this and more on that. But I'm not very good at all that kind of stuff. It's just I'm old school. You know, back in the we did we didn't have all that social media. You were you were you were a, you're an actor. You went to a casting. You were judged by what you delivered. Now it's a case of how big is your social media following, because that represents bombs on seats in the cinemas. So you have to really nurture that as well. And so it's a whole new platform for me to learn and to develop. And then, so I'm still sort of developing it and learning it over the years. So yes, please follow me on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> Are you happy for people also to contact you to, to, if they want you to be on their shows or do autograph signings? Do you do those sort of things as well now? In fact, I did an autograph signing just a little while back, a few months ago in London. It was an amazing experience. I was, it's the, one of the first times I've actually had an, an autograph session for me. Do you know what I mean? And uh, I was really surprised. There was like over 2,000 people that turned up and whatever. And it was, it was amazing. It was like a sign, I, I signed autographs all day long. I thought I was going to be there for about five minutes because I thought maybe two or three people turned up. There's a couple that flew in from Holland just to get an autograph and flew back again. And that wow. was, the, and I swear, they, they got married on the Friday and they flew out to the UK on the Saturday, came to the show, got their autograph signed, got a picture taken and then flew back Sunday night. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what? For me? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's crazy and it was because i had been in doctor who and yeah. i was only i was only in a very as i said it was one episode of doctor who i did but that again is such a massive cult following and uh, these people were just dedicated you know, doctor who fans and they flew all the way over just to get the a signature in a picture so that was fascinating for me that's really fantastic to know that obviously people know of you and they're going to come that far to see you so yeah that's awesome that I've, I've worked a few comic cons now and i see it all the time i think wow the fans are so dedicated they are really dedicated and the thing is right what i found fascinating is the fact is the ages the age range you know you get people in their 70s and 80s i had a, a two guys that came all the way from newcastle and came all the way down and they brought me because i've got my own now toy from pirates of the caribbean my own character and nice. they came for me to sign the box they traveled all the way down from Newcastle for me to sign the actual box that the, my character was in. And I was like, you guys drive all the way down from Newcastle to get an autograph on a box. And then you're driving all the way back. And yeah, I was like, wow. Because I still can't comprehend it. For me, I'm just a guy from Reading, regular guy, martial arts, father, grandfather. And I like to keep my feet firmly on the ground. I'm not really in that headspace of movie star or, or actor or whatever. You know, it's just, to me, it's a job. And yeah. I love love what I do and I love the idea of being able to play different characters and I love the challenges that it presents me and um and it, and it keeps me in shape I love to you know I mean because for me it's like there's a reason every day for me to get up go to the gym do my stuff because I want to be at the top of my game for as long as I can be and now I've gone into producing as well now so that's another uh, string to my bow but I still find it difficult sometimes to get because like I'll be walking through the supermarket and, and people will be like Hi, Winston, can I get a picture? I'm thinking, I can't remember where I know you from. Oh, you don't know me. I'm off this. I saw you in this movie. I'm thinking, oh, yeah, I was in this movie. <laughs> I remember now. I remember that I'm an actor. And it was really, I was sat at home the other day with my son and my daughter, my, my grandson. I was watching TV and all of a sudden I'm watching this movie. I thought, this is a really good film. And then all of a sudden I saw my face and I was thinking, oh, yeah, I was in that movie. Because <laughs> I actually forget myself. You know, it's crazy. <laughs> so my, my, my final question to you would be um, what advice will you give to anyone that's looking to get into acting or get into being an extra worker or even getting into martial arts like what kind of things did you use to keep yourself motivated and keep going and keep pushing forward that's a very good question and I always say to, to, to anybody who wants to get into the acting game if you're getting into acting because you want to become famous or you want to make loads of money forget it you have to have a real passion 
for it because it really is highs and lows in this industry. You know, one minute you can be making, you can be working, and then for months or years, you could not be getting anything. And so you end up getting very disheartened. So you have to be dedicated, you have to be committed, and consistency is the key to everything, whether it be martial arts, whatever, whatever you choose to do in life, you have to be consistent. And if you're not consistent, they, it's never going to pay off because the thing about it is I made a decision 30 years ago that this is what I was going to do. And I said to myself, this is the bullet I've bitten. This is the one I'm going to take on. And uh, believe me, there's been some lows in this industry for me as well. I'm not going to try and make, oh, it's all been, it's all been brilliant. There's been some lows, but you've got to be, you've got to push through. You've got to be dedicated. You've got to be consistent and you've got to be trying to always develop your skill sets as well, you know? I'm constantly, I, I, I suffer with dyslexia. And when I was at school, I never, I never would read in public. I'd never go and stand up in the public. Since I've become an actor, I now read scripts and I started pushing myself and learning how to read scripts and developing. And now they use me as a keynote speaker, as a host for shows and stuff like that. So I'm getting all these different types of work now because of it. And that's all developed from you know, the consistency, the determination, the dedication to your craft. And I think that's what I would, that's the advice I'd give anybody that wants to sort of, whether it be martial arts, whether it be acting and whatever field you want to do, you have to be dedicated, you have to be consistent, and you have to turn around and be prepared for those low points. Because there's nobody in this industry that can succeed without failure. There's no such thing. You fail and you succeed. You can't, you just, you, no one just, gets out there and cracks it. It's just impossible. Do you feel like martial arts sort of really helped you then with your acting to keep you consistent with your acting? Oh. So you had that dedication like in you already. Oh, without doubt, without doubt. I think that was the platform for me, the foundation for me, because I start, I was very, very fortunate. You know, martial arts became, has become very commercialized over the years. You know, you've got, everybody's a black belt, everybody's a world champion, everybody's got this now, everybody's done that now. Back in the 60s and 70s, that wasn't the case. There were very small groups and you had to be good. <laughs> you know what I mean? I remember with my teacher, he made us sit in the horse stance, in the basic horse stance, and that was all we did for months. We'd go there, we'd pay our money, and we'd just sit there, and that's all we'd drill the martial arts stances. We didn't even throw a punch. I don't think I threw a punch or a kick for about three months. Wow. <laughs> the stance work, and no punching, no kicking, just stance work. And that's what we did. And... The classes would start off really big and then they'd dwindle down over the weeks down to about maybe five or six people. But those were the people that he kept. And we all, we all funny enough, we all went on to become either instructors or instructors in our own, and actors in the industry. Because the guys that I ended up training with from the beginning, they're still doing, they're still teaching to this day. They're still teaching to this day. You know what I mean? But I think that was the foundation of it. And then that taught me discipline. It taught me in my craft to, to sort of stick to it and drill every single day and i've transferred that into my acting and my production that same type of mentality you know so, awesome yeah. well, that's that's so great for you to obviously be on with us today winston i know it was just a little quick talk today because it is sunday <laughs> it's all and I, I really appreciate it and I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we finally got a chance to talk you know what I mean? so i'm sorry it's been so rushed but today's my grandson's birthday so i've got to go off and go spend some time <laughs> I, know, I hope he's having a good birthday and hope you do spoil him rotten obviously it's his special day <laughs> no it is mate you know how it is <laughs> but yeah thank you so much again for being on it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you and i hope i'll see you at a show or we bump into each other guaranteed ben guaranteed it's been a pleasure stay blessed mate Stay blessed too, mate.